Okay. We had a double baptism at uh, St. John's, which is lovely. Mom and daughter, fun to do. I'm going to now dive into uh, our time together here. I'm actually going to be preaching from uh, the Ephesians reading. So, Faye, if you don't mind just going to the Ephesians reading, that'd be lovely. Okay, one more, one more. Yeah, actually, can I have the clicker so that I can go forward and backward? Is there? Blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, give me a second to just compose. So last week we we read we I preached from Ephesians chapter three where Paul prays for the church in Ephesus, and this week in Ephesians chapter four Paul is going to exhort the church in Ephesus. Now, what he's trying to exhort them is to be united, to be together. Something has happened in, in Ephesus, and they're, be, they're very divisive. And so the entire exhortation from 1 to 16 is, be united because God is united. Because God is one. The faith that you believe is one. which just happens in verse 4 onwards, right, right here. There's one body, one spirit, which are called to one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Basically, Paul's saying, look, we believe in the same thing. We are one body. We teach the same thing. We do united things. So why aren't you united? Be united. And this is supposed to remind us of John chapter 17, verse 20 to 23, where Jesus prays to God and he says, Lord, I pray that they may be one as we are one. To be united is a divine quality of the church. Ravi Zacharias, a famous apologist, quoted for saying this, the greatest abomination for Christianity are its denominations. We are called to be united, but we are incredibly divided. And so Paul says, there are three things that we ought to be thinking about and doing in order for us to become united. All right? And these will be the three points of my sermon as well. The first is this, you need to have godly character. The second is you need to be working out of your gifts. And the third, you got to grow up. All right? They're all there. First, godly character. Second, be united in your gifting. And third, grow up. In fact, Paul actually uses that word, grow up, later on. Let me show you. But speaking to himself, we, we must grow up in every way into him who's the head, who is the church. Not my words. That is Paul telling us to act mature. So let me preach on it, and we'll go. I'm going to start on verse 1, all right? I, therefore... The prisoner of the Lord beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And then he goes into conduct. I uh, have a barber downtown Toronto, and him and I have great conversations because he knows I'm a priest, and he knows he is anything but Christian. All right? And so he tells me all the problems he has with Christianity. Why do you all believe this? Why do you all believe that? What's going on with this? And I was having a conversation a few months ago, and I... And I was very nice about it, and I asked him, well, why do you care what we believe? And I kind of surprised him. Because he's like, well, because y'all are the moral you know, standard for the Western culture. And I'm like, do you, do, you, do, you, do you adhere to the moral standards of Western culture according to the church? What was his answer? No. And I'm like, why do you care what the church says? You all know people who who's given the excuse, if I come to church, the church will burn down. Yeah? I think it is an absolutely silly excuse. I'll tell you why. What, what, is, what is their thinking when they make this excuse? I don't want to come to church. Sure, let's get past that. Right? They're thinking, I am not good enough to come to church. I'm so bad that if I come to church, that hellfire is going to come into church. 
I'm so bad that if I come to church, it's like Satan himself is coming to church. The church will burn down. I will burn up. That's silly. That's silly for a few reasons. One, I'll give you the primary reason, is that Jesus hangs out with sinners. There is no requirement of perfection or holiness in order to be a follower of Jesus. God calls you as you are. But once you're in a relationship with Jesus, once you know who he is, he then challenges you in the conduct of your life. Your calling precedes your conduct. Think of Zacchaeus. Jesus doesn't look at Zacchaeus, and the first thing he says is, give all your money to the poor. No, he says, I'm coming to your house. And then he responds to God's call and says, come. And upon entering into his home and being in a relationship with Jesus, his conduct is challenged. In the same way, for anyone who believes in Jesus, conduct is a challenge. But for those who have yet not believed in Jesus, it's the calling that matters. God invites you to a relationship with him first to show you how much he loves you, how much he cares for you, how much he only wants the good for you. And a challenge to conduct proceeds. It's been a problem in the church. Let's get real, right? Because we have so often gone out into the world, into the culture, and we've said, you got to do it like this, you got to do it like that. And the thing is, they don't believe in Jesus. Why do they care? The primary role of a church is to call people to Jesus, not call them to good conduct. But once they believe in Jesus, the church within itself begins to challenge the body to right and holy conduct according to the word of God. Once you're in church, once you know who Jesus is, once you have a relationship with Jesus, Jesus is going to say, I need you to stop lying because I love you and I care for you and I want you to know what truth is. I need you to stop cheating on your spouse because that's not what brings life. I need you to stop being angry. I need you to stop doing all these things. In the context of the relationship you have with Jesus. Conduct, sorry, calling precedes conduct. And conduct is a challenge for a person who believes in Jesus. So Paul gets this. So that's why he says, I beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called. You believe in Jesus. You're a church. You follow who Jesus is. Now live in a godly way. He only challenges believers. And how does he challenge them? What are the four things? Humility, gentleness, patience, and forbearance. Okay, bearing with one another in love, forbearance. And he says all these four are godly attributes, not good characteristics. There's a big difference. There are a lot of things that we may say is good, but might not be godly. To be godly means that it is an attribute of God himself present in us. So as a church, we are to be conformed to the image of Christ. And Paul is outlining four godly characteristics for unity. I'm going to go through it, and then we'll talk about it, right? Humility. Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 11 says, I am a God who is humble and gentle. Both. Matthew chapter 11. What is humility? Humility is an opposition to pride. Pride, a person who is proud says, it's about me, I'm the best, I'm the greatest. Look at me. A person who is proud has not yet met God. Because if they know God, they know that they're not perfect. A person who's proud has not yet met God because they have not yet met someone who's greater than them. A person 
who is humble knows God. C.S. Lewis says, humility is not thinking less of yourself, which is what we normally think of. i got to be humble, think of myself less. I'm lower than everybody else. No, C.S. Lewis says, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking less about yourself. Which means you're not so preoccupied with your own self, which is what pride is. But you actually free up space in your life to start thinking about other people. And that, Paul says, promotes unity. That's a godly character. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only one and only Son, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. God isn't saying, the first thought of God is of the other. Humility is an attribute of God because it thinks of the other. Two, gentleness. What do we think gentleness is? Soft-spoken, quiet. You know, I think of like a curtsy when you think of gentle, you know, flowery. That's not what gentleness is. Jesus himself says, I'm gentle. And he goes, fashions a whip, whips people, turns tables, gets angry at Pharisees, calls them out on their sin. But the thing is, everything he does is done in gentleness. Gentleness is strength under control. Gentleness is being able to say hard truths at the right time, with the right tone, and with tact. Let me explain. I find that one of the one big reason, if you've ever seen any movies or even in your own life, right, that couples argue is because even though if one person's right, it's said at the wrong time. You know? The wife or husband comes back home after a long day's work, and then the one person just says, you know, and this happened, and how dare you do this? And this is not the time to bring it up. I'm tired. And then it gets into a fight. It's not done with the tone of love, but rather, ah, bah, 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 it's about me. It's not done with tact. Tact is being aware of the circumstances that surround you before you bring up a hard truth. Jesus was gentle. He spoke hard truth. But he did it at the right time. When he went and flipped tables in the temple, no one could accuse him of doing something wrong because it was timed correctly. He spoke truth. He did it with tact. The right time and had the right tone. Even though it was harsh, even though he flipped tables, he says, but you are making my father's house a den of robbers. It was said in concern of the other, not in concern of one's own self. Three, patience. I'm not going to go on about patience. You all know what patience is, right? What is patience? Patience is something we wish we had right now, right? What is, maybe I'll take some time to get that little pun. Okay. Uh, what is patience? Patience is knowing that things are going to take time. It's the opposite of instant gratification. I want it now. You will never regret taking time with people. What creates disharmony is when you get short with someone. Unity, you will always take time with that person, even if it feels like they're annoying. Patience. Then it's forbearance. Forbearance, I love forbearance because it's basically Paul saying, I'll put up with you and you got to put up with me. Kind of like that. Uh, in the church, we forgive sin, but we forbear strangeness. Okay, let me, let me, let me talk to you about that. So uh, today is uh, Tia and I's sixth, sixth year anniversary. Very exciting. Big round of applause. Yay for us. Okay? No, 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 no. Don't applaud. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Uh, and um, so I asked her last year, it turned out, I asked her also this yesterday. I'm like, hey, since you've been married to me, what is something you've learned about me? Right? And then uh, she's like, you asked me this last year as well. I'm like, oh, okay. And so I have the same answer. She said, uh, since I've married you, I've learned that you are a very particular person. Which is just another way of saying, geez, I just did not understand how weird you were with certain things about your life. And one of the, I think one of the reasons we've made it to six years and, and for the rest of our lives 
it will be that she will forbear with the weirdness of Noel's particularities. Right? You all know this. For any of you who have been married for a long time, you forbear with the strangeness of your husband or your wife. It's the same thing in the church. Unity is promoted when we forbear with the strangeness of one another. We all have our idiosyncrasies. We all have our particularities that make, us, make someone love them or make them really annoying. And part of what it means to be in unity is to forbear with the strangeness. But we never forbear with sin. In the church, among Christians, we forgive sin. But forgiving sin involves calling the sin out. Speaking hard truth, but done so in gentleness. We call the sin out, then we forgive. But we forbear with the strangeness of one another. These are godly characteristics. In fact, the forbearance and patience is found throughout the Old Testament, even in the Hosea, not Hosea reading, what was it? Um, what was that, Samuel? But in Hosea chapter 8, verse 11, it says, My heart recoils within me. Oh, how can I do this to you, Adma? How can I do this to you, oh, Ephraim? God is so patient with his people. I'm slow to anger, abounding in love. God is patient and will forbear his strangeness. Think of how weird the disciples were with Jesus. At one point, People deny Jesus, and the disciples go, okay, so let's rain hellfire down on these guys, eh, Jesus? And Jesus goes, absolutely not. What a weird thing for you to ask. I don't want to kill people. God continually forbears with us. Next is uh, found in verse 4 to, 4 to 8, 4 to 7, 4 to 6. Basically, we are one, and Paul is emphasizing that one baptism, one Lord, be unified, be unified. And he says, now, through this one God, you belong to one family, verse 7, right? And in this one family, you are given gifts. When a new baby is born, what is the first thing we do? We shower them with gifts. We hold a baby shower. They get all these cool things. In the same way, when you belong to the family of God, only for Christians, only for those who are in a relationship with Jesus, when you belong to the family of God, you are given gifts of the Holy Spirit. And Paul outlines five gifts. A-P-E-S-T. Apostles, prophets. Let me go to the next slide. Eleven. The gifts, that were, uh, that the gifts he gave were, some, were that some would be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, or shepherds, right? And teachers. A-P-E-S-T. Uh, the problem with our church, I was listening to a pastor preach on this, and he called it apest. Apest. So the problem with our church is we, are, we have a very weak ape and a, st and a strong st and a st st. So there's a reason, and we, if we have a weak ape and a strong st we're going to become stagnant, stationary, and stuck. We need the beating of the ape for us to be strong Christians. Let me explain. We're often quite afraid of apostles, prophecies, and evangelism. Even when I use the word evangelism in some of our churches, people are like, oh, I don't want to talk about that. I'm going to talk to you about this. I'm going to talk to you about these gifts, what they are, and as I talk to you about them, think if you have these gifts. Paul says, God gives his people these gifts. I'll quickly go over it. Think, if, think about if it's one of them is you. Apostles are people, uh, in the Greek, it's people who are sent. They do new things. They're called to find the new ministries, figure out where the church wants to go. The apostles are people who ask the question, what's next? What can we be doing? What are the new ministries? People like Mary. She's always coming and talking to me about these are the cool things that we should be doing as a church. These are the new things, the new ministries we should be involved in. Then we have prophets. Prophets are people who look to the past. If apostles are looking to the future, prophets look to the past. They are the ones who are given the God-given gift of realism and discernment. 
So when the apostles like, we've got to be doing these, these new things, these are the things that God might be calling us to do, the prophet goes, whoa, whoa, hold on. Is this God's will for our church and for our community? Prophets have a real understanding of where God might be leading. And they'll con converse with the apostle in that discernment. Next, we have the evangelists. Evangelists are recruiters in the church. They're the ones, if you have more non-Christian friends than Christian friends, you're probably an evangelist. If your heart beats for another, when they, when they don't know Jesus, and you're like, if you only came to church, if you only know Jesus, if you only knew the gospel, I wish more people came to know Jesus. If that's you, you're probably an evangelist. The apostle goes, hey, these are the new things we should be doing. The prophet goes, but what is God's will in all this? And the evangelist asks the question, and who are we going to reach? Who's going to become the next Christian? How is the gospel being spread? Then we have the shepherds, the pastors. The pastors are the caregivers of the church. And you know you're a shepherd when you are attuned to someone's sadness the moment you walk into their homes or into church. And you go beside them and you say, hey, how you doing? You all right? They have that emotional intelligence. If you are a person who cooks, like Carol, you take it to people who, uh, who are hurting, who are not doing well, you're most likely a shepherd. You want to care for the people in the church. And then finally, we have teachers. Teachers are the people who have the special anointing of God to clearly explain Scripture, the Word of God. If you keep reading, it says, we must no longer be tossed to and fro. I'm over here, verse 14, at the bottom. <clears throat> Blown about by every kind of doctrine, by people's trick trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking truth in love. I want to come to the other part later. Basically, a teacher is one who is able to keep the church on track with the right doctrine, making sure they're not going by the, through the ebb and flow of culture and saying, hey, come back to the Word of God. This is what the Bible says. This is the narrow road. That's the role of a teacher. Now, as you are thinking and as you are going through this, you're probably thinking, maybe this is me, or maybe this is this person. Maybe that's that person. Paul says all of these gifts are meant, I'm going to go over here, verse 12, up, up, uh, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. You are given this gift in order to be mutually encouraging of one another, to grow as the body of Christ, and to come to maturity and a greater understanding of Jesus. The gifts given to the body are for the people in the body. The gift of apostleship, evangelism, prophet, teacher, and shepherd are for the church. And how you use it will build the church. How you encourage one another in this will build the church and bring you to maturity. But if you ignore these gifts, it is not good. Maybe one day, Will, you can do the, the spiritual gift test in, in our church. I'll just throw it out there, O oh teacher. Right? And then, here's my last point. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way, into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and is together by every ligament with, with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth, and building itself up in love. Paul says, time to grow up. I have a two-year-old. She is by no means a grown-up. Would you all agree? Uh, I would like to thank everyone else in this room, if, except for Rua. Who's that one over there? All right. All right. Hi. Except for these two, our grown-ups. There's a difference between a two, three-year-old 
And a 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 year old isn't there. See, for children, there are toys. For adults, we have tools. For children, they have rights. It's about me. I want to do all these things. For adults, we more, it's more about responsibility. For children, it's more about me. It's my playtime. I need these things. I'm hungry. I want this. For adults, it's about we. For kids, it's about now. I want it now. Oh, the number of times, even this morning. We have no bananas at home. I want a banana now. For adults, maturity is later. Toys become tools. Now becomes later. We becomes me. And rights become responsibilities. The sign of a mature church is mature. <laughs> if when these things are present. When we use our God-given gifts, not for my own self-aggrandizement, but I can be better, it becomes a toy. If we use it for our own pleasure, then the gifts that God gives us is a toy. But the gifts that God gives us is meant to be tools that build the community. When we become people that are patient, caring more about the later than the now, and understanding that the work of God, the work of sanctification takes time, that's maturity. When we understand it's not about my right, it's not about what I want, but I have a responsibility for the people that I'm in community with, that's a sign of maturity. When we go from me to we, it's a sign of maturity. One of, one of the, I'll, I'll end with this, okay, then you can ask me questions and everything. One of the uh, drawbacks of our current Western culture is individuality. It's held in such high regard. And more than that, there's this new thing called expressive individuality. You know what that is? It's when you want to show the world, express to the world, my individuality. Like you put filters on Instagram, look at me, these are the things I believe in. If you're on Facebook and you have one of those banners, that's expressive individuality. I want to show you just the kind of person I am. This is who I am. This is what I believe. This is, th these, this is what makes me. And the problem with that kind of a thinking is it's not unifying. I become my own island, my own silo. And Paul says, stop thinking about you. Stop thinking about the me. And start thinking about the we. Stop thinking about your own rights, your own identities, and start thinking about the unified identity of what it means to belong to the people of Christ. Stop thinking about yeah, your, how to how to bring pleasure to yourself by playing with toys, but use tools to build up the community that you belong to. In order to promote unity, you need godly attributes, you need giftedness that works together, and you need to grow up. I'm not saying in all of this that you all don't have this. Okay, I'm going to end with this. I have seen in this church great maturity and the use of the gifts in wonderful ways and godly character. But now that it's been identified, these are the things that build unity, it is up to all of us here to lean into it with intentionality. Figure out what your gifts are. Figure out where you need to be chiseled away to be more godlike. And when there is immature behavior in the church, call it out. That's my sermon. We're going to pray, and we're going to keep going. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who calls us to godlikeness, to godliness, to be more, made more in the image of Christ. We thank you that you've given us the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You've given us prophets, apostles, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. Help us lean into our gifts so that we may bring glory to who you are. And Lord, we thank you. Though the message may be hard, that you call us to grow up. Help us think less of ourselves and more of you and others. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Questions? Well, wait till the end. Any questions? <laughs> there is, that's the end. Do you have any? Okay, yeah. It was going to be mentioned in the prayers about uh, a certain anniversary this week. Um, so I'm going to take that out of the prayers and, and just wish you and, 
and your good wife a happy sixth anniversary. Thanks. You can I gotta, also pray for us. I got I got to admit that it was, it's a little surprise. We surprised some of us that she lasted. She lasted <laughs> a few six years. Anyways, um, and uh, just to let you know, Dennis, you you and I are now out of the pool. On how long the marriage will last. <laughs> uh, we move on to our confession. 